Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Namibia, land of the brave. Brave men and women who dedicate their lives to protecting a country of harsh terrain, ancient cultures and vulnerable wildlife. Namibian conservationists Dr. Rudy and Marlies van Vuren are on a mission to travel the length and breadth of Namibia to meet these intrepid individuals and to witness the incredible work they undertake on a daily basis. These are the unsung heroes of Namibian conservation and these are their wild jobs. Dr. Nad Brain is one of Namibia's most interesting and well-known conservation personalities. The man has a CV as long as my arm, but it takes you a long time to get that information out of him. For 13 years, Nad was the state veterinarian in Itosha, where he did some interesting research on how elephants communicate. He also has a PhD in ecophysiology after he and his wife Ginger spent five years living with the baboons in the Quisep River. And above all, he's one of Namibia's best bush pilots, with 8,000 flying hours. Now, before every takeoff, you do a pre-flight. Can you tell us what you're looking for then? Yeah, you know, considering the, the conditions we fly in, and basically for any flight, you really want to check everything on the ground before you fly, because once you're in the air, it's too late. So you really want to <laughs> go, through things, the, yeah. <laughs> go through the plane from nose to tail and check absolutely everything. Just to make sure there's nothing out of the ordinary, everything's functioning, everything's in place, nothing's changed from the last flight and so on. So Still it's very important. Wings Probably one of the most important parts of the flight actually is what you do on the ground. Oh, okay. So yeah, you can see the props take a, take a real beating on these kind of airfields. So the thing is, you just want to check it and make sure there's no new big nicks or anything. Um, so you just go through that and then major part of course is the engine. You want to make sure everything's a, in place, there's no leaks, there's no, um, all the levels, the fluid levels, everything are okay. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a complex thing looking at it like this, but you have certain key parameters that you just check and you go through and everything. Um, there of course must be no bird's nests or nothing change overnight. It's quite common that in these areas for animals to make use of a plane for shelter, for nesting, all this kind of <laughs> stuff, so it's important to I think that's the thing with bush flying, is you know, you, you need to look at different things than you probably would if you yeah, were flying. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit a different in this kind of environment because yeah. the plane's exposed to all sorts of things that it wouldn't usually be exposed to at yeah. other airports, yeah. especially insect life, vertebrate life, Man, large mammals, hyenas, lions coming to chew tie or whatever. Sometimes even an elephant yeah. scratching itself on the plane or whatever. Oh, hell. And you've seen that, Ned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do come and do that occasionally. So it's the flight surfaces are of course incredibly important. They take a bit of a beating too as you can see on that edge over there, stones coming up from the prop from these kinds of runways. So it gets, you know, checked regularly when it goes for maintenance and stuff, but just while in between it's very important to check everything. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. you can see that. Takes a lot of hammering. A bit of, yeah. bit of a hammering there. Yeah. Careful of your head there. Make sure everything is free and uh, has its full movement. Great. Mad, Rudy and Mollys are heading to the Waterberg Plateau. With its distinct jagged cliff faces, the Waterberg Plateau is another of Namibia's most stunning landscapes. In addition to its impressive geological formations, the Waterberg National Park is home to a wide variety of incredible wildlife.
Matt, we have so many different vegetations, but what about the animals on top of the mountain? Yeah, that's an interesting um, concept because you must remember that uh, initially Waterberg didn't have any animals on top because there was no water. So everything is, every animal you see that has been brought at some stage, they have increased tremendously and have done really well. But it's an artificial situation. All the animals were introduced essentially. And so um, because it is such a different system up here, you know, we have the sand felt vegetation in, which differs completely to what's around the park. So it's, a, it's almost a closed system um, and it's um, closed by itself, really. It's the, it's the, the cliffs around the park that are actually the, the natural boundary of the park. So the animals are almost like on an island then? Yeah, it's, it's, it, this is a, there's a, it is an island, an insular population, and it's a managed insular artificial population. But yeah. they do extremely well, and you can then broaden out and put the highly endangered species and, and animals in here. Yeah. And uh, they just, it, the, the place itself just needs a huge amount of, of good management, because yeah. it's very sensitive. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. say, you know, for diseases and yeah. whatever goes in and comes whatever out, you have to manage. Is extremely well monitored, and is what especially what goes out, um, and that's why the buffalo and many other species here are so valuable because they are disease-free. They're very clean. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Next on Nat's schedule, Hawani home to Namibia's famous desert elephants. <laughs> Having spent years studying elephants all over Namibia, Nad's wealth of knowledge on these special creatures is second to none. Ned, does these animals, do they differ from any of the other elephant, Etosha or Kodum? No, well, you know, these elephants genetically and physio physiologically are identical to other elephants, essentially across the entire of Namibia. The only thing that's really different about them is their acquired behavior. It's a learned behavior. It's a generational thing that's been passed on for a long time. And that makes them really special. You know, if we're standing here now, it's absolutely silent. We actually hear less than one third of what the elephants are talking about in any, in any sign. They use extremely long um, wavelength sound communication, infrasonic stuff that we can't hear. So two thirds of the stuff we don't hear. And if we were recording and we played it back at 10 times normal speed, there'd be continuous talking going on now, uh, continuous. And what we found was, um, you know, if we put it in like a, in human terms, if you have to make a long distance call and you've only got enough money to make one call, you make sure you do it at the right time. And we found at certain times of a day, um, the sound communication just skyrocketed. And that led us to look at the lower atmosphere. Um, and, and perhaps there's something going on in the lower atmospheric conditions. Um, and we actually then shifted our study from the, from the elephants to the lower atmosphere. And, um, we were able to find that um, because of this extremely long wave, long wavelength communication that they use, they are able to communicate that sound through bushes, trees. It's not impeded by any way, but um, it's also able to reflect off certain of certain surfaces. And one of those surfaces occurs in the atmosphere. And we've all seen that that's a lower atmospheric condition when it's perfectly wind still. It's called an inversion layer, where things change very quickly over a short space of time short vertical distance. Temperature and wind direction change completely. And we found that they were able to then bounce this long distance, this uh, long wavelength sound that they're making off this inversion. And then it just stays like that and it goes on for, you know, we find conservatively speaking, 200 square kilometers they're able to communicate. So that's a minimum. So it's much more than that.
there is much to learn about these giants of the desert who have evolved to thrive in this harsh terrain. Only through continued research of the Namibia's desert elephants will their fascinating secrets be discovered. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager. Pilot and vet Dr. Nad Brain is on a journey throughout Namibia. His next stop is in Itosha National Park, where the carcass of a rhino has been discovered. After inspecting the carcass, Nad has found that the cause of death is natural. Ned, we're here at a rhino carcass and uh, your suspicion is that they died of anthrax. Can you tell us more about it? You know, it's a, it's a very unique situation that we have here and it's, it's unique um, actually in the world. It's only this place in the entire world where you have a system where anthrax is part of the natural uh, cycle of things um, in Itosha without any panic of outbreak or disease or anything like that because it's endemic and it's been part of the system forever and for as long as we know. So what we really need to try and understand here in, um, in this Itosha area is uh, we have to first diagnose that it is anthrax um, but we don't take any measures after that to uh, such as vaccination, panic attacks, uh, quarantine, all that kind of stuff because it is part of the system in the wildlife system. Now talking about panic, a couple of years ago the Americans had that big uh, scare where uh, the anthrax was put into envelopes and sent to New York. And the story goes that uh, they phoned you and asked you for advice. So you literally worked for the FBI for a while. <laughs> it, it, was, it was quite close to that actually. You know, we, we see so much anthrax here. We, um, we see it basically, you, you can see it every day if you look for it. And uh, the important thing about it is that we actually then know quite a lot about it. And um, they helped us quite a bit with the development of new diagnostic systems, which was great. And we helped them by, by offering what we knew about it. And there was equipment and information exchange, which was really good. The story goes that uh, when President Bush phoned you, um, you addressed him as George. But we don't know what he addressed you as, Professor Brain or Dr. Brain? <laughs> That's classified. <laughs> Joking aside, Nad's knowledge of anthrax and the measures to combat it have been essential to its effective management in Namibia. Rudy and Marlies conduct work with cheetahs in southern Namibia, an area previously thought to be relatively anthrax-free. However, a dead oryx found on the property raises questions.
Ned, I know we've talked about anthrax before in the north um, at Itosha, and you guys know that there is anthrax in Itosha. But now you've established that there's also anthrax here in the south of Namibia, here in the Namib. Yeah, it was only late last year that we first diagnosed it um, positively and without any doubt that we do have anthrax in the number. It's a bit surprising that we haven't found it before, but we did test for it and we got positive results. We had lab results confirm it. And since then, um, we've actually found there's quite a lot of anthrax in the south. Because this influence um, us having cheetahs in the south, because we once in a while shoot a RX or a springbok and feed them. And if it's positive, they can all die because I've lost cheetahs like that in the past, like a few years ago, that we got a zebra in that was trophy hunted. We fed the animals and the next morning we got there and all the cheetahs were dead. No, absolutely. And that's something, again, the north has taught us is that um, how sensitive cheetahs are to anthrax. Um, the fact is that they probably the only carnivores that in, in this part of the world that don't have antibodies. And the reason for that is that they, they don't scavenge enough. Um, and when they, so that they're not exposing themselves to the disease. So if, if they feed on or kill an animal that's got anthrax and is in the last phases and they eat it, they will all die. So it's absolutely critical that you find something like this that is very suggestive that it could be anthrax or now that we know that it's here, it's very likely to be that you are able to test for it, you know, before you utilize any part of it at all. And that's why you brought your your uh, doctor's bag. It's not for a house call, it's for the test. Yes, so what, we, what we do now is we have this little test and um, it's extremely useful because it, um, and it's, it's very diagnostic because it looks for the um, a part of the anthrax toxin that is specific. It's a, the anthrax toxin's got three factors and one of those factors is the protective antigen. And if it becomes positive to this test which captures the antibody antigen reaction it is absolutely diagnostic that it is anthrax. So it actually works like a pregnancy test? It's exactly the same. We call it a chromatographic assay. We will be putting some, any, some fluid in the well and it wicks up. The capture antibody is located in the bottom part. And if there's an antigen antibody reaction, it shows up as a line, as a color change. And, um, and that's absolutely diagnostic for anthrax. Oh, okay. And when did you develop this test, Ned? This test was developed in the last decade as a, in a combined effort between us and the United States Navy, actually. And the work was all done in Namibia because we had, do have so much anthrax in the north. And uh, we've started putting it in practice since then and we get, we get the delivery from then. And is it, can anybody get it? Any other vet? Uh, we are trying to make it commercially available through, through the people in America. And I think we're not too far from that. Well, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, we should actually test every carcass that we feed to our animals for anthrax mm. because it's so deadly. Okay, so we can, you know, after such a short time, we can see that it's definitely negative for anthrax. We do have a positive line there showing the test works and it's, it's really is as quick as that. And if it was positive, I mean, what would be... The yeah, outcome, you know, in the old in, in the in the days before a lot of research was done on this, so you always used to think if it was anthrax positive, you had to burn the carcass, bury it, you had to do so, all sorts of things, and we've actually found the opposite to be almost true. If you can keep the, the carcass closed um, for a couple of days, uh, the putrefactive bacteria overcome the anthrax and actually neutralizes it in a way. So that's a w first way, uh, but if there are a lot of predators and carnivores around and they're immune, which thank goodness most of them are, if they consume this carpus really quickly, then um, they also neutralize the, the contamination and the infection almost at that spot. Fantastic. So we can feed this to the cheetahs? It we died of something them. else? Yeah, it died of something else. Okay. nothing going to waste in this environment and having concluded that the carcass is indeed anthrax free some lucky cheetahs get a very special feed one of the most positive people I've ever met in my life. He's played a huge role in conservation 
and we are really privileged to have him here in Namibia. With his incredible flying skills, he takes people to the most awesome places in our country. And his skills as a vet makes him very valuable for us as conservationists. Nad Brain is probably the Chuck Norris of conservation in this country. Next week on Wild Jobs Namibia. With tourism being Namibia's fastest growing industry, we explore the effect it is having on our people, landscapes and wildlife. Wild Jobs Namibia is proudly brought to you by Vintuk Lager.